nurses help chemo patients, moms post-delivery diabetes, diagnosing via the internet, and we're going to take a look at ways that you can help your patients find high-quality resources for health information online. If that's what you're looking for, you found it. It's The Nursing Show. Welcome to this week's Nursing Show episode. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this week's program. I'm looking forward to this week's episode quite a bit, including a look at a news item that we found um, on simple nursing interventions, improving outcomes for chemotherapy patients. Uh, I'll be talking to you about that and also ways you can direct your patients to high quality online health information resources. And all of that will be coming up after this week's nursing news items. Before we get to all that, I do want to remind you to follow up on all of the information in this episode. Take a moment to visit nursingshow.com. Click the link for show notes at the top of the page, and it will take you right to the most recent episode. You can scroll down, find all previous episodes, going all the way back to episode one if you want. Follow up on the links for the news items there, as well as the additional resource links that go with the tips of the week and interview segments each week. All of that is available for you to follow up on there at nursingshow.com. If you want to get back in touch with me, please drop me an email. I love to hear from you, and I do respond back to all the emails that come in. So send those emails in to nursingshow at gmail.com. I love to hear from you, and I look forward to getting those news links, uh, perhaps interview suggestions with you or somebody you know, whatever the case may be. Keep those emails coming. I'll have some more contact information coming up later on in this episode, but I guess we'll go ahead and get on into the rest of the show as we get ready for this week's news. Newer oral chemotherapy drugs are often more effective than what we've used in the past, the traditional IV infusion medications, but one problem commonly associated with oral chemotherapy regimens is the complex dosing instructions that often accompany them. Patient compliance is a huge issue. Even given the life-threatening nature of cancer, patients are having trouble following these drug regimens. So what we need to do. Um, patients need to take drugs multiple times a day in a cyclic regimen where medications are taken for several weeks followed by some sort of medication holiday and then starting over again. This complicated dosing scheme coupled with the uncomfortable side effects often cause patients to even intentionally skip doses. Researchers associated with the Michigan State University School of Nursing are trying to find ways to improve compliance through telehealth follow-up calls and nursing assistance with compliance and side effect symptoms. Uh, patients in the study that I'm talking about here were broken into three groups with one group receiving automated calls from a specially designed system that reminds the patient to take their meds and includes tips to manage side effects. The other two groups received live nurse guidance along with either automated pill regimen calls or other sorts of side effect management calls. The groups all showed increased adherence to their regimen, but the automated calls alone, without the live nursing interventions, were actually as effective as the calls that included live nursing assistance. This shows again the effectiveness of some form of follow-up telehealth care, even if it's part of an automated program. More studies needed, and they're going to be doing some more looking at broad air patient sampling, and I'll be following up on that here in the future here on Nursing Show in the news. But I wanted you to hear about this as we continue to explore telehealth nursing care options. Next up in the news is a study looking at pregnant women with a pre-existing condition of type 1 diabetes. The study showed that these patients have trouble bringing their blood sugar back under control to pre-pregnancy levels after the baby's born. This shows that uh, pregnant women with diabetes are need, need really careful ongoing assistance both during the pregnancy and afterwards to manage their blood levels, uh, blood sugar levels. Uh, in the study, women with type 1 diabetes, their A1C levels were tracked before, during, and after the pregnancy. A1C levels went down slightly during pregnancy, but when tracked up to one year after delivery, the A1C levels went back up and actually up beyond the pre-pregnancy A1C levels. 
Women also retained an additional 9.7 pounds compared to their weight before pregnancy with a concurrent increase in body mass index. This study points out the additional risks for pregnancy in women with type 1 diabetes and, I think, more importantly, the need for help managing their disease during pregnancy and afterwards. Since most diabetes management programs are run by nurses, these patients are likely to run into a nurse during the course of their pregnancy who could take the lead in helping them to prepare to get back to their normal pre-pregnancy A1C levels. Um, this is important. It might include new mom fitness programs, nutrition classes, or something similar to that. And I hope you'll look into this in your community. I'm curious how you might handle this. I know we have a lot of nurse midwives who check out the nursing show and members of the audience. I'd love to hear from you and have you share your thoughts with the rest of the nursing show community on managing pregnancy with diabetes. Uh, touch base with me here, nursingshow at gmail.com. And let's see if we can set up an interview for a future episode. I'd really love to hear from you. We all know that the internet can be a great tool for health information when used responsibly. But we also know that parsing that information for the best health information can be a bit of a minefield. This is why a recent survey of U.S. adults is a little bit alarming. According to a survey from the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C., one-third of all American adults have used the internet to either diagnose a health problem for themselves or for a friend or relative. The article I found in medicalnewstoday.com says that over 80% of Americans now use the internet on a regular basis, and 60% of them have used the internet to access health information in some way. 35% of them actually use it for diagnosing a health problem. People were also asked who they turned to for health information when they had a problem, and in addition to the internet, the good news is they turned to more traditional resources, with most seeking help from a medical or healthcare professional. A relative or someone else also was somebody that they sought when they needed advice, especially those with a similar condition. Now, of those who use the internet to self-diagnose, nearly half use the information they found as encouragement to seek professional health assistance, and that's a good news item. But um, at least 40% of the time, their self-diagnosis was confirmed by the healthcare professionals, so they actually got correct information, but only 40% of the time. So what does this mean for us and how we interact with our patients? Well, for one, we can no longer rely on just telling our patients, stay away from the internet for health info. We need to be proactive. We need to provide them with access to credible online health information that we can stand behind. Most of them are gonna look up some sort of health information, whether we ask them to or not. And at least some of them will seek diagnoses options there, rather than coming in or before coming in for a professional opinion. Um, I'm curious about you in the audience. What are you doing out there? Are you providing resources for your patients uh, that you come in contact with, whether it's for general or specific healthcare problems? I'd love to know what resources you use for different things that you come across with your patients. So get back in touch with me. In this week's tip of the week, I'm going to be looking and following up on that final news item on patients using the internet to self-diagnose problems. This is a growing issue, as that article points out, and we just can't tell them to say no. Don't, you know, just say no isn't an option, really. We need to provide our patients with lists of credible resources and good information. So what I've done here in this tip segment is gone through and looked at putting together a list of resources I use and recommend here regularly on the show. And talk about how you can identify credible resources for yourself. So for the tip of the week this week, we're going to be talking about web health resources and some of the ways you can parse out what are the good ones, what are the bad ones, and, and places that you can recommend to people you know and to patients and to colleagues. And so let's go ahead and jump in and look at these. We're going to be defining reliable health resource. What is a reliable online health resource? Um, what is a reliable offline health resource? I mean, these are things that we need to set up ahead of time, so we'll talk about that. We're going to look at the three sources of trusted web health. I, this is what I um, consider uh, the three things that you can look for and three basic uh, subcategories of online resources that I, I think you can use as a starting point. Um, that includes the government, the institutional resources, and patient-based or consumer focused and based resources. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth and give some examples of what I'm talking about there. 
So what is good online health care resources? Uh, what do you do to define that? I have found on Wikipedia uh, a, a, an entry on Health 2.0, and I think this actually is a great place to really think about that, and, and the way to think about it is Health 2.0, and a new way of thinking about healthcare. And our online resources and connected society and social media connections all make healthcare uh, a much different place than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, Health 2.0 can really uh, mean something, and, and it means the use of specific set of web tools by actors in healthcare. Um, actors in healthcare would refer to physicians and and patient advocates, nurses, other healthcare professionals. Patients themselves are actors in healthcare. Uh, anyone involved in healthcare. And those individuals, those actors in healthcare, are using principles of open source and generation of content. So resources they find online, um, open source programming and things like that, generating content by the users and using the power of networks like social networks and online networks in order to personalize healthcare to collaborate and promote health education. And um, I think that that's a good way to define online health, and, and it's a good starting point for us. So one of the things that you want to think about is how can you parse out what is a good resource, what is a bad resource? Well, I've come up with some criteria here that you can kind of start asking yourself some questions when you get to a website and, and see if you can answer in the affirmative to some of these questions that will help you determine whether or not a resource is a good, trusted resource. Um, starting out with, is it from a trusted source? So the information you're getting, is it coming from a place that you would trust if you were talking to an individual from that source? Uh, and so you can think about, you know, a federal government member of the federal government that is uh, involved in healthcare, and uh, say so you're talking to uh, a, a physician who works at the CDC. Well, that's a trusted source. So you might take what that person says with a little more authority than you might talk talking to a physician in your hometown who is not connected to all of the resources that the CDC has to back it up. Um, not to say that your local physician isn't a good source and a trusted source, but you can see the difference between the two as I describe them there. Also, is the information research-based? We talk about research-based medicine all the time. So what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that uh, is, is the information backed up by studies? Uh, is there uh, other information that's documented in citations? Uh, do we have uh, links to other resources that are trusted or could be considered trusted resources? So um, I try to do that in my show all the time here by including links to where I got the information and links for you to follow up and get more information from what I consider trusted resources. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things I try to do here on the show is document and provide links to other additional resources for you to do more follow-up. Is it dated and updated? So um, it, can you tell when the material was written or recorded or whatever the case may be based on a date stamp on an article? And if it's been updated, is there a date stamp for when the most recent update was? So that's important because uh, medical information changes as we gain more knowledge and some of that information can go out of date and no longer be valid. Um, links to other trusted resources. We talked about that in documenting and citations. And usability. And, and maybe this one should be first in the list um, because we're talking about patient care resources. If, if the link that you give to a patient takes them somewhere where they can't find the information they're looking for, it's not easy to navigate. Um, the articles are written to uh, a much higher level of understanding than the patient has. Well, then it's not usable information. And you've sent them, it might, well, might as well be written in Russian. Uh, unless they speak and read Russian, it's not going to be of any use to them at all. So uh, again, this is uh, something to keep in mind as well as usability of the resource. And I'll talk about that as I give the examples here coming up. Three basic sources of online information 
are government-based resources, and we talked about the CDC as an example, and I'll, I'll use that again here coming up. Institutional resources, resources from educational institutions and resources from uh, other institutions involved in healthcare, and then patient and consumer resources. And while you might need to take some of these with a grain of salt, uh, I think that there could be some excellent and, and more valuable resources found here if you take a little bit of time to find them. And we'll talk about that too. So what are we looking at when we talk about government resources? These are often the most easy to find. Um, and I have to say that um, the federal government here in the U.S. and I think in a lot of many parts of the developed world, the World Health Organization is another example, really provide good resources. Um, the first go-to resource that I always use and you'll probably see it on the site for tips of the week that I do here on different kinds of diseases and things, is the National Institutes of Health. And you can find that at NIH.gov. And they have a, in, in the National Library of Medicine, which is an online resource, which is awesome, um, you, you find the Medline Plus, which is an online encyclopedia of medical terms and information. Um, and you can find that at nlm.nih.gov slash Medline Plus. Um, there's a link in the show notes for this, and, and I would urge you to check it out. But um, this is basically an encyclopedia of everything that has to do with healthcare. Uh, you can look up lab tests that somebody might be getting. Um, you can direct a patient here, and they can look up different aspects of the disease. There are links out to other trusted resources that aren't even you know that aren't all federal government resources, but resources to trusted institutional websites. And all of that is the information that you can find on the Medline Plus. So that's my go-to resource for a lot of things. It's a great place to get started when you're trying to look up information, especially consumer and patient-based um, or directed information, you know, resources for the layperson. Um, it's great for healthcare professionals too, but it, it's, it's a great resource for patient education tools. CDC.gov is another one. Um, you know, Centers for Disease Control have uh, their morbidity and mortality reports. You can sign up and get an email whenever they release new report data on morbidity and mortality updates. Uh, you can find information on ongoing health care situations around the country. You go there now, you'll find all everything about influenza and the seasonal flu and flu vaccines. Um, and a little while ago, we had things going on about West Nile virus. Uh, all that information is readily available and updated on a regular basis. It makes it a great site. And the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ.gov, which is a little known agency uh, of the federal government, but provides just tons of links to additional resources on every kind of healthcare, as well as information on how um, you can find quality resources in your area, um, how to rate your doctors and your hospitals, and how to understand um, what it is to be a responsible and cooperative patient in cooperating with your he healthcare and becoming a partner in your healthcare. Um, great resources there. So if you look at the picture, you know, the front page tells you all about usability, the Medline Plus health information right there at the top, trusted health information for you. We can trust this site, not just because it tells us that it can, but because we know it comes from the National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health. It's a really great uh, information page. Um, it's always updated. Uh, right now, it's featuring stuff on flu and directs you to flu.gov. So if somebody was looking for information on flu, they could go right there and find it. Um, you see information, popular searches, and, and some updated recent articles that are posted here, as well as information on different health topics listed alphabetically, different drugs and supplements, and some podcasts and video tools and a whole bunch of other stuff. Great resource. Here's the AHRQ site, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and their front page talks about... Um, hospitals. There's information here for healthcare professionals as well as consumers and patients and really gives everyone uh, a place to start when talking about quality healthcare and quality research in healthcare. And I think just uh, an under uh, underutilized resource. People don't know a lot about that this is sitting there waiting for them. And this is from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so it is, it is again, a trusted resource. 
and the Centers for Disease Control. Again, you look at the front page of the website and you see it's easy to navigate. It's not overly busy. There are um, health and safety topics. It's regularly updated with new information, with current news and press releases. And as you see, winter weather and flu are two things that are trending right now that they think are important to be right there front and center at the top of the front page. So a good information site. Um, and, and I just can't say enough about it. Uh, the CDC site is, is another go-to resource for me. What about institutional resources? Well, institutional resources refer primarily to trusted health or educational sources. Um, when I talk about trusted health or educational sources, what do I mean? Well, healthcare organizations, you know, hospital organizations that are out there. Um, I think of the mayoclinic.org. Um, you can go to mayoclinic.com and that is more about the business of their hospital. But mayoclinic.org is just loaded with general health information. In fact, it's so loaded with general health information that it is commonly linked to from the Medline Plus page over at the National Institutes of Health. And that's because it is a great resource and, and I often link to this one as well. For pediatric information, for both healthcare professionals, for parents, for kids themselves, and for educators, you can't beat kidshealth.org. This is from the Nemours Institute. Um, we have, there, there are several different children's hospitals run by the Nemours Foundation. And uh, we have one near us in Delaware, the AI DuPont Hospital for Children, um, where my kids go when there's some kind of issue coming, cropping up. That's where we go for specialists around here. Um, but it is a great resource. And the neat thing about this is they have resources for all ages. So kids have information here that they can access that is at their level and easy to understand. So if you've got a child with a health care issue, perhaps a chronic problem, this is a great place to point them to help. Them. They can look up and empower themselves by finding their own health information from a trusted resource. And there's information there for parents, for healthcare professionals, and also for educators who want to integrate health care information into an, a lesson plan or something. So good stuff there. Professional organizations are another place that you might find institutional resources. And, you know, I always take some of this with a grain of salt. Uh, this is where you start getting into parsing out agendas and things like that. So, um, you know, your, your professional organization in nursing, perhaps, uh, has, has a great website with resources that are available publicly. Uh, and there are other resources out there, in professional organizations. But sometimes professional organizations have an agenda that they're, they're pushing, either about their specialty or perhaps about um, some issues. So you have to kind of understand and, and read between the lines a little bit on some of the things. I don't want to downplay this too much because it is a great resource. And one good example of that is the American Academy of Pediatrics page, and that can be found at aap.org. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics pages have a ton of information on immunizations for children, on preventative care and preventative projects for keeping kids from getting injured, and updates on information based on research that they are doing within their organization and, and spotlighting from within the organization. So that's just a perfect example of that. If you look at usability, you look at the picture here on the video version of the site, and if you're looking at that, you can see um, the Mayo Clinic site has just easy to read. They feature specific information, and um, you can also find information there that's targeted at medical professionals. So uh, again, a, a great resource for both you and for your patients. Kids Health from the Nemours Foundation uh, is right there, and you can see the starting page tells you right away that it's easy to use. There's a link, there's just a box there, click for parents, click for kids, click for teens, and then there's a separate area for educators. And this makes it just easy to figure out who needs to know what, and you just take them to the place where they can find the best information. And I can't say enough about kidshealth.org. Then, of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics site, also easy to navigate with featured information and uh, updates and recent articles, and you can find all of that uh, right there at aap.org, and that's a good example of an institutional um, association site for a professional organization. Patient and consumer resources are our final segment 
in, in what we're looking at here. And what do I mean when I talk about patient and consumer resources? Well, these are some of the places where you can find the true gems of health information that your patients really need to know. Starting off with uh, looking at participatorymedicine.org, which is a great site that talks about the partnership that needs to happen between a patient and their healthcare professionals, that the patient is an involved and informed member of their own healthcare team, that they are empowered to answer, ask questions and find information and share what they've discovered and talk to their healthcare professionals. And the healthcare professionals are receptive to that conversation. That's what particip participatorymedicine.org is all about. Patient blogs are a huge resource, and one of the things is that they give personal opinions about dealing with some of the healthcare issues, dealing with side effects, dealing with answering questions from family members. And you know what? These are just things that if you, ha if you aren't a nurse who has a problem just like the patient has, you're just kind of going off of your good nursing education background and trying to provide good things for your patient and, and supporting them. But I, I tell you, a person who can answer their question better is someone who's actually been down that road before. And so you can refer, if you can find some good patient blogs within your specialty that focus on that type of problem, you can direct your patients to them and they will find some incredible resources and knowledge there. Um, one that I like to always hold up is a, just the, the epitome of patient blogs is Carrie Sparling's sixuntilme.com. And it is a, the story of a woman who's dealing with type 1 diabetes. Um, and, and she's been running this blog for a long time now. And she's talked about everything from how to pick out a wedding dress that will have a place for your insulin pump to how to deal with having a child and answering questions about why you keep sticking your finger and drawing blood and things like that. You know, answering all those little questions, plus information on diabetes diet and, and art and recipes. And I mean, it's just a perfect example of what a good patient blog should be. So, you know, check that out. Finally, in patient and consumer resources, health insurance and pharmacological sites should not be discounted. Um, yes, there is a certain amount of advertising that's going to be present. You know, they are promoting their products, um, their services. However, it is in their best interest to provide high quality healthcare information to their customers, to the public. And so you will often find some very targeted and specific information that they have discovered and find that have to do with whatever specialty they're involved with. And, you know, we'll talk about that here coming up. But always consider the source. So, you know, you got to take that information and, and parse it a little bit more. But if you have a patient dealing with, for instance, um, a specific type of uh, blood glucometer, okay? Um, you might direct them or look over first and then direct them to the glucometer company's website because there may be some great specific resources on how that glucometer works best, on tricks and tricks of how to use it properly and use it more efficiently and not have to cause as much pain. Um, there's just all kinds of things that have to do with being good customer service that they are putting there for their customers and their customers are your patients. So direct them to those resources is often a good place to start. Looking at usability, here's the Society for Participatory Medicine website if you're watching the video. Again, uh, a good description of what it is and describes exactly what they're about. Um, they have blog pages and journal pages and links to additional resources, white papers that they've published, and uh, just a good place to learn about being a good patient, uh, a good active patient and involved in your own health care. So good place to direct patients. Um, looking at Carrie's Six Until Me blog, very clean website, very easy to read. It's a blog, so she writes articles. The most recent article will always show up first, and you can scroll down and find previous articles or search for a topic. And she has links to other diabetes blogs and websites on her site as well that she trusts. And if you like what she has to say, you may trust her opinion about these other sites. Also, we look at um, a final look here at the Pfizer website. And the Pfizer website looks at how patients 
uh, dealing with the certain drugs and medications that Pfizer produces, you're going to find great resources from Pfizer on their own drugs because they're providing that information. Now, again, you've got to parse out the, the, the marketing spiel that might be going along with it. But in the meantime, they make the drug, they've done all the trials, and they probably know what most of the side effects are. Um, they may not, <laughs> we can always worry whether they're underreporting the side effects, but ultimately, this could be a good resource from a customer service standpoint for your patients, and it shouldn't be discounted automatically. So, you know, always consider this as a final point to look at. Just as a review, Join the Health 2.0 movement. Get involved. Think about health in a new way using Health 2.0 as your springboard. Start with three different types of sources and find those resources for your specific type of patient with from the, either from the federal government resources, institutional resources, or patient and consumer-based resources, and you will really provide an excellent service to your patients. Consider the value and validity of each resource carefully when using those criteria that I talked about here at the beginning of the segment. And finally, again, just looking at all the resources I had here um, from the NIH, CDC, Mayo Clinic, Kids Health, Participatory Medicine, and Carrie's blog, um, I will have links to all of those in the show notes. And I urge you to follow up and take a look at them for yourself. And, and let me know what you think about these resources. Do you have some other resources that you like to recommend that I didn't touch upon? Let's get a discussion going here. And maybe we can create a, a place where we are sharing those resources with each other and, and finding good resources that we can trade back and forth, I think is a good place to start. So um, that's this segment on finding good online healthcare resources. And that's going to wrap up this episode of The Nursing Show. I want to thank all of you for checking out the show this week. And make sure you take a few minutes and follow up on the information in this and any of the other episodes over at nursingshow.com. There's a link for show notes right at the top of the page. And you can follow up on all the news links and additional resources for the weekly tip and interview segments there. It's really your job to do that. You'll also find a place on the right-hand side of the Nursing Show site where you can sign up for the Nursing Show email newsletter. So if you'd like to get those links and episode announcements to your email box, well, you can just fill out that form and submit it, and you'll get all of that stuff sent directly to your email every week with the show. Just another great way for you to stay up to date on what's going on here at the Nursing Show. If you want to get back in touch with me, please do so. I love to hear from you. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments on the show, shoot me an email to nursingshow at gmail.com. I work really hard to respond back to every email that comes in, and heck, I might even be able to share your email with Nursing Show community, so keep those emails coming in. They really help drive the show. You can also connect with me on Facebook or Twitter, other social media sites as well, under the handle PodMedic. So uh, you can friend or follow me there under twitter.com slash podmedic or facebook.com slash podmedic. And don't forget the Nursing Show fan page on Facebook. We're zooming past 1,500 fans there, continuing to grow by leaps and bounds. And you can join that community by visiting facebook.com slash nursing show. Click the like button at the top of the page and join the community there. Share, post links, like the links, uh, leave a comment on the nursing news and insights that I post there throughout the week. That's it for me. I'm Jamie Davis, your host. I'll wrap up this episode of The Nursing Show by reminding you to stay safe and stay tuned here to The Nursing Show. Take care. <laughs>